We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Great to see you. Even in the summer, this room is maxed out, and we're really glad that you're here. Uh, we are in uh, a middle of a series called Unshakables, where we're talking about matters of our faith that we are, we're just certain that when we understand the truth of God's scripture, these are things that are core doctrines that we shouldn't, that we should be unwavering on, all right? And we have two weeks left. We have this week, we're going to talk about a concept that many people find pretty intimidating or scary. It's a concept called eternity. What does this church believe that the Bible is clear on when it comes to eternity? Next week, we're going to wrap up the series. We're going to talk about the church, and then we're going to start a 12-week series going through the book of Colossians together, and I'm excited about that. So let's start uh, at the very beginning, right? We're going to put up on the screen our big idea statement, what this church knows the Bible teaches about eternity. Would you say these words out loud with me? You ready? I think you guys can do better than the 815 service because you're more awake, right? Here we go. It says, we believe all people as God made them were created to exist forever. And there is a day coming when Jesus will return to determine those who have separated themselves from God by sin and those who are in union with God through forgiveness. Having rejected God, unbelievers will suffer eternal condemnation apart from him, hell, and believers will receive, be received into eternal communion with God, heaven. All right, so that's what the church has up on its website because this is what, when we read God's word, it says about eternity. And so we're going to explore this a little bit more Maybe all of us will be able to walk away understanding a little bit better the theology of eternity. Uh, there's a few things that I want to highlight. The first thing, and if you're filling in the blanks this morning, is that we were created to exist forever. Every single one of us in this room, uh, the way God originally designed creation, right? He created mankind to live forever. And uh, unfortunately, because of sin, not everyone is going to live forever, but all of us will exist forever. We're going to talk more about that uh, as far as where that, where that happens and what happens forever. But if you're in this room right now, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're not, all of us are, we're designed to live forever and all of us are going to exist forever. We were created to exist forever. In fact, we see a passage of scripture where Jesus is talking about, uh, essentially he's talking about how some people have honored him by taking care of the least of these, and others have rejected him by rejecting the least of these. And here's what he says to them in Matthew 25. He says, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go on into eternal life. So some will experience eternal punishment, some will experience eternal life, but what do all those people have in common? this concept of eternity. All of us will exist forever, okay? That's something I want to make sure we know right off the bat. Here's the second fill in the blank. We're going to go pretty quick this morning, is that Jesus will return. Now, the way it's worded in our essential statement, it says that Jesus will return in order to determine. In other words, there's going to be some decisions that need to be made upon Jesus' return Another word that we use when we're talking about Jesus determining would be called the judgment. All of us are going to stand before a judge. Now, I want you to know, though, that there are two different judgments mentioned in Scripture. You're going to go to one judgment or you're going to go to the other. Now, let me tell you about the two judgments and we'll figure out which, which judgment you'll be standing in one day. All right. The first one is called the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is where anybody who's got 
uh, a sin on their rap sheet, right? That Jesus hasn't taken care of it. They haven't swapped out their sin for Jesus's. So they're standing on their own account. They've got some stuff they got to deal with. They're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. All right, so that's one of the judgments. There's another judgment called the judgment seat of Christ. It's also sometimes called the bema seat judgment. I, I, I want you to understand what the bema seat is, and then you'll understand this judgment, right? The bema seat is like that special place that people, that judges sit at like a competition. So maybe it's a dance competition or a gymnastics competition or a diving competition or maybe just track and field where the judges are making sure you're following the rules. And these judges are different than the type of judge you would stand before if you go to the courthouse, right? Two different types of judges, two different types of judgments. You see, the great white throne judgment has a type of judge. God, in that case, is a judge like a judge you would experience at the courthouse, that's a kind of judge where you go to be uh, uh, to determine guilt and to determine sentencing, right? If you've got anything on your record, then the sheriff's going to come and grab you, right, and take you before the judge, and the judge is going to determine what your sentence ought to be, and then or whether or not you're guilty, and then what your sentence ought to be. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, guess what? If you're in this room and you've decided to trade your record of sin and brokenness for Jesus' record of perfection, well, guess what? The sheriff's never going to take you before the judge. You're not going to experience the great white throne judgment because there's nothing on your record. You hear that? There's no reason to grab you up and take you before a judge for sentencing if your record is clean. My record's clean. I'm not going to go to that judgment. But there's this other judgment, right? The Bema Seat Judgment, where if you think about two different types of judges, right, there's the judge that gives sentencing, but there's also the judge at a competition that's really judging how talented you are. Now, let me, let me put it this way. If I, all three of my daughters dance, and they're on a, a competitive dance team, so they go to competitions, and the judges watch how well they dance and then determine whether or not they're going to get pins and trophies and stuff that they go home with. If I were to enter into a dance competition with them. If I were to say, you know what, that looks fun, put me up on stage, I want to do a solo, let's do this. Now, I would get up there, and I, I tell you, I would be the laughing stock of the whole competition, right? It would not be a pretty thing. I would get up there, I would do some things. The judges, though, uh, they probably would withhold trophies. They wouldn't put me on a platform and say gold medal, right? I, I wouldn't win anything, but I also probably, hopefully it's not so bad, that I'm being thrown into prison for it, right? You see, the two kinds of judgment, there's a, the judgment that determines guilt and, and punishment, and there's another type, type of judgment that determines whether or not you are going to be receiving rewards. Those of you who are believers, listen, all of us will stand before the judge. As a follower of Christ, you're going to be part of the Bema Seat you know, the judgment seat of Christ, where you're going to have to give an account for how you use the gifts and the talents and the personality and the experiences and everything God gave you. How did you use those things to accomplish the purposes that God gave you? You're going to have to give an account. You're not going to have to stand before him and, and explain your sin because Jesus took care of that. But I promise you, you're going to want to be able to, you don't want to go up before that second judgment and say, listen, I, uh, I'm so thankful that I don't have to spend eternity away from you in a real place called hell. I get to spend forever in heaven. And, and, and then God says, well, show me, what did you do with all that I gave you, all that time, all those talents, all that treasure? What did you do? And you're like, well, nothing. Listen, in that moment, the, the judge is not going to reward you for your lack of participation in the purposes and plan he had for your life. And so all of us are going to be judged. This is something that before that, that uh, uh, this kind of supernatural version of eternity begins, at some point you're going to be standing before a judge. It's either going to be at the great white throne judgment or the bema seat judgment. Did everybody learn something new maybe? Maybe some of you are like, I already knew that. I already knew that. Now listen, though, 
there are only two options in Scripture for where you will exist forever in eternity. There are real places that we're going to cover as our number three and number four in our notes. You're going to either spend forever in a real place called hell, or you're going to spend forever in a real place called heaven. And the Bible talks about these, and we, we should know what the Bible explains to us about these things. Before I even get into talking about hell or talking about heaven, I want to I talk about something else real fast. I, I love this quote from Randy Alcorn, and here's what he says. He says, the best of life on earth is a glimpse of heaven, and the worst of life is a glimpse of hell. For Christians, this present life is the closest they will come to hell. And for unbelievers, it is the closest they will come to heaven. I want you to understand that if you are a follower of Christ, the the evil and brokenness that you experience, the pain and the sadness and the suffering, the depression, all those feelings that don't seem like they're good, they don't seem godly, they don't seem like they're part of God's original plan. Listen, all that you're experiencing right now, this is the closest you will ever get to hell because Jesus saved you from the alternative. Now, those of you, though, who choose to stand before God at the great white throne judgment, You decided, I don't want to take Jesus' perfection on my record. Instead, I want to have my own record. I want to stand before the judgment seat, and I want to pay uh, the penalty for my crime. This world is the closest you will ever get to heaven. Now, let's talk about number three in, in your notes. Number three, what does the Bible tell us about hell? Now, let me, let me explain real fast. I don't like talking about hell. Nobody likes talking about bummer subjects, right? Hell is a difficult thing to talk about. Let me tell you a few reasons why I don't like to talk about it. One, I don't think it's ever a good evangelism strategy to try to scare people into a relationship with Jesus. I promise you, a relationship with Jesus is awesome, and in and of itself, that's what you should be pursuing. I want a relationship with Jesus because of Jesus, not because I'm trying to avoid the punishment I've got coming to me in hell. And so I don't want to scare anyone into a relationship with Jesus. Jesus in and of himself is plenty of reason to have a relationship with Jesus. Have you ever, have you ever seen the show King of Queens? Anybody ever seen that show? When my wife and I had like infants in the house, like years ago when our girls were really small, when we were up late at night with feedings and diaper changes and things like that, King of Queens was always on. And so we'd turn on the TV and it was just it's a way that passed some time. And we, we enjoyed, there's this one episode where Doug, he's like the lead male character, the husband in the show, uh, the King of Queens, that's him, right? And there was a show where he's going to his parents' his childhood home, and his wife is with him, and so she's sitting there, and the, his, his dog, Rocky, comes up, and he's like, oh, this is my dog, Rocky. We've got so many stories. Rocky and I, we go way back, and she's scratching her head like, Doug, how old are you? There's no way this is your childhood dog, and he's like, yes, it is. This is Rocky. My, my mom and dad, will you please tell her this is Rocky? And they're like, well, Dougie, this is Rocky Five, right? <laughs> this isn't the... And he was like heartbroken, but the, their whole reason was we didn't want to break your heart. We didn't want to talk about something difficult because nobody likes talking about difficult subjects. Well, hell is one of those things we have to talk about, and here's why. I'm going to put this on the screen, all right? If we don't accept the reality of hell, we won't rightly understand the glory of the gospel, In order to fully embrace how great a gift Jesus' death on the cross was for you, you have to understand fully what he saved you from, what he doesn't want you to experience. And so we got to talk about hell. In fact, you know, Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. It's interesting. Now, before we get into a, a, a conversation about hell, I do want you to know another kind of fun factoid about scripture. Sometimes when you're reading scripture, you read about Hades. Sometimes you'll read about hell. 
And they, these are technically very similar, but they're different things. Just like if you know there's a difference between prison and jail. A jail and prison are two different things. When you get arrested uh, under the suspicion of doing a crime, they're going to take you and put you in jail. That's prejudgment, right? The judge and the jury, they haven't decided whether or not you're guilty yet. So you sit there in jail. And, and then you have your court, right? You have that great white throne judgment. And then the, the judge looks at you and declares you guilty. And then you go to prison to finish out your sentence, right? There's a difference between Hades and hell in the same way. Hades is where, in Scripture, it's the pre-judgment place of the dead, where people have died apart from Christ, right? We know that if you're a follower of Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Those of you who are not in a relationship with God, before the judgment, which you haven't been judged yet, you'll, you'll experience a place called Hades, and then you'll experience the great white throne judgment, where then you'll experience a real place called hell. Now listen, nobody wants to be in prison, Nobody wants to be in Hades. It's not like there's a, 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 a good prison and a good jail. No, like prison and jail are all both places we don't want to be, just like Hades and hell are places that we don't want to be. And so we want to understand there's a lot of similarities to these places, but they're technically different. Another thing about the word hell, if you never knew this, when Jesus talks about hell, it comes from uh, uh, the word Gehenna, which means the valley of Hinnom. This was a real place, all right? So Jesus was trying to give people a glimpse of something supernatural by talking about a real place. The valley of Hinnom is where, where human waste and dead bodies and garbage would all be gathered and basically dumped into this valley, and there was constantly a fire consuming this. So you just imagine the stench of burning flesh, burning sewage, burning waste, all this stuff. This was the Valley of Hanam. No one would want to go to the Valley of Hanam. So when Jesus uses this word uh, Gehenna to, in, in reference to this word that we translate into English as hell, it gives us a little bit of a picture of what we're talking about. All right, so let's look at a story. In, in Luke chapter 16, there's a parable that's told, and it's a parable of two main characters. You have a rich man, and you have this poor, very uh, ill man named Lazarus. And you hear about Lazarus and the rich man and the interaction that they have. Lazarus sits outside the gate. The rich man has all that he needs, and at some point, they die. You see, Lazarus loved, uh, was in a relationship with Jesus, and, and the rich man, the rich fool, was not. And it says in Luke 16, verse 24, now this is, a, remember, the rich man is now in the pre-judgment version of hell called Hades. It says, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. Using just this verse, let me point out a few things that we know about Hades and that uh, we also know about hell. The first thing is this, hard truths about hell. Hell is real, and it's not pretty or fun. If you ever hear someone say, you know what, if there is a hell, I'm going there, and I'm going to be, uh, come find me at the big fun party. It's not a party. It's not pretty. It's not fun. Words that are used in scripture to describe hell are a fiery furnace, burning sulfur, a place of weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. It's also described in scripture as outer darkness, a place of no light. Here, here's another hard truth that I want us all to know about a real place called hell, is that hell, hell is experienced. What I mean by that is it's not something that you'll be able to to sleep away. It's not something that you'll be able to avoid. All the, the feelings, the senses, the emotions that you would hope would turn off in an experience like this. No, you're going to, if you're in hell, according to scripture, it's something that will be experienced. It will be felt. It says in Revelation 14, verse 10, it says, they will be tormented with fire 
and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb, the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night. Imagine not even being able to to fall asleep in the middle of this torment. See, one of the things we notice, though, about the rich man in that one verse from Luke 16 is it says that he was conscious and he was aware of the punishment that was happening to him. He felt it. He experienced it. Here's the third thing I think we should all know about hell. And this one's the hard one to really wrap our heads around, is that we know that hell is just. Hell is fair. If you notice, the rich man understood in this passage that what was happening to him was just and fair. He's not complaining about injustice. He's not saying, this isn't fair. I didn't do anything to deserve this. He understood in that moment that what was happening to him was just. What he's complaining about is the pain and the agony, not the injustice. You know, one of the biggest doubts that all of us experience, whether you're a believer or not a believer, many of us have asked this question. Some of us are still struggling with it right now in this moment. And the question sounds like this. If God is really all loving, why would he allow people to spend an eternity in a place, a real place that Matt's describing right now called hell? How could a loving God allow people to spend an eternity in a place like this. It doesn't make sense. Have you guys ever struggled with those thoughts before? I certainly would raise my hand on that. I've I've struggled with this. Like, why? Why, 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 Why is this just? Why is this fair? It doesn't make sense. And I think what we have to understand in this conversation is that our uh, when we when we don't understand the fairness or the justness of hell, we are also short-sighted in our understanding of God's holiness. In fact, let me, let me put this on the screen for us. It says, it is impossible for God to be holy without also being just. Because God is holy, he is also just. He has to be just in order to be holy. You see, hell was created as a place for him to deal with Satan, for him to deal with Satan's minions, you know, demons, and also a place for him to deal with, listen to this, people who decided on their own accord, who have decided and chosen to reject a relationship with Christ. You might say, well, how could a loving God send people to hell? I would flip that over on you and say, listen, God loves you so much that he refuses to force you to spend eternity with him. You get to choose He loves you so much, he gives you a free choice. Nobody has to go to hell. Everybody has the opportunity to choose a relationship with Jesus. And he loves you too much to force you into that relationship. It says in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7, it says, He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. Let me help you understand this verse a little bit. There's a passage in Scripture that says that there is one sin that is unforgivable. Have you ever heard the verse of the unforgivable sin? The unforgivable sin, according to Scripture, is called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You might think, well, I hope I've never done that. I don't want to accidentally have committed the unforgivable sin and be stuck and now uh, unable to be forgiven of that thing. Well, let me explain. Let me take some of the fear away and tell you what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means. Essentially, God has created an opportunity for you to enter into a relationship with him uh, through Jesus Christ. And part of that is when you enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you get a free gift, essentially, of the Holy God living inside of you through the Holy Spirit. You, if you're in this room and you're my brother or sister in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Now, some people, for whatever, have said, you know what? I don't want the Holy Spirit in me. I don't want God dwelling in me. I don't want a relationship with Jesus. I don't want a relationship with God. I reject, I blaspheme, if you will, the Holy Spirit. I reject a relationship with God. Essentially, 
What that means is you're making a decision that one thing that everyone that will ever be in hell has in common is that they rejected a relationship with God. They rejected the Holy Spirit. They rejected him. And so if you are a brother or sister in Christ, you, you haven't done that. Maybe you, you, maybe you at some point in your life you were hard-hearted and you, you didn't want a relationship with Jesus. But listen, at some point in that process, you said, no, I want to open up my heart. Holy Spirit, I receive you. God, I want a relationship with you through Jesus. And you're now in the family of faith. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Here's a, another hard truth about hell. Is that Satan wants you to believe that hell isn't real. You want to know why Satan's strategy is to convince you that hell isn't a real place? Because believer, listen, if you don't think hell's a real place, well then what's going to get you off your couch? <laughs> You're not going to want to give or serve or participate in making sure other people know about the good news of Jesus if you don't think there's really a, a real place called hell. So Satan would love for us to all be apathetic and to pretend that there's no real punishment, there's no real eternal experience place called hell, so that we just sit comfortably and do nothing to change other people's eternity. Now, I don't like talking about hell. Can we... Can we switch it up and talk about heaven? You guys want to talk about heaven? I want to talk about heaven. That's number four. Remember, there's only two options. You're either going to spend an eternity in hell or an eternity in heaven. The problem with heaven, unfortunately, is I have an impossible task. If you're wanting me right now to explain to you the incredible majesty of heaven, Scripture actually says I can't do it. That's impossible. It says... In 1 Corinthians 2, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Even if I were to give you a picture in your head where you could like imagine, like daydream how incredible heaven is, the Bible says your daydream that you just came up with, it doesn't do it justice. Heaven is even better than that. I imagine that there's colors that we don't even know exist. There's, there's senses that we don't even, we've never experienced. There's emotions that we've never even ran into before. That heaven is so amazing, we don't even know some of the things. Our brain has never even processed some of the, the beauty and glory of heaven. But we do know a few things. At one point, the apostle John received a prophetic vision in the book of Revelation about heaven. Let me read this passage to you. If you have a Bible with you today, you can find this in Revelation 21. I'm going to read the first five verses and verse 7. Here's what it says. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, for God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eye, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever." And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. All To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. And I will be their God and they will be my children. If you notice the dichotomy of the one verse we read about hell where it says that, that the rich man was in, was in the prejudgment form of hell, right, right, in Hades. And he just, he wanted Lazarus to come with just a, just dab your finger in some water to try to quench this, this anguish on my tongue. And here we read, to all who are thirsty... 
I will freely, give freely from the springs of the water of life. It's a complete opposite picture. And so let me share with you real briefly uh, with the, the 10 minutes I have left, some wonderful truths that we learn about in Scripture about heaven. If you've ever wondered how to explain heaven to other people, hopefully some of these points will be helpful. Uh, some of the things we know about heaven because God's revealed them to us in his word. The first thing is this, that heaven, we know, is the absence of everything bad, of all bad, and is the presence of all good. In other words, heaven will have no uh, abuse. It will have no pain. It will have no evil. It'll have no depression. It'll have no anxiety. It take anything evil, anything bad about this world, and all of that we know in Scripture is going to be gone, and instead replacing it is everything good, probably even good we've never even thought up before. It's the absence of all bad and the presence of all good. I put some Scripture on the screen, too, for you to look up later if you like. By the way, the, the new heaven, the new earth, we're still going to have many of the same things we have right now. We're just going to have the, the evil free version of them. We're going to have the good version of them. You know, for example, you know, we're, we're, Scripture actually shows that in, in the new heaven, we're still going to have work. We're still going to have a job to do, but it's not going to be a job that we hate. It's not going to be a job we don't want to do. It's going to be something that brings us joy. It's going to be something we want to do. It's going to be the, the good pure version of work. Things like that. Still have much of the same things, but the good version, not the bad. So if I'm trying to interpret this in my head, I want you to picture what won't be in heaven. You know, I wrote down a, a small list. In heaven, there will be no bad breath. <laughs> I can imagine in heaven, there will be no cats. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. How, can we just trade out all cats for kittens? I love kittens. <laughs> just kittens everywhere. Clearly, I'm a dog person. Do you know in heaven, by the way, there's going to be animals. All, all the animals, maybe even animals we haven't even seen on, on this earth, but the animals, the, the dogs and cats and all, just the, the really good version, all the, all the evil is gone. <laughs> Here's the second thing we learn about heaven. In, in scripture, is that heaven is beautiful beyond your imagination. Heaven is beautiful beyond your imagination. If I were to give you right now a, a prepaid visa with uh, unlimited, uh, you know, amount that you could spend on it, and I told you for the next 10 years, I want you just to travel this world on me and fly wherever you want you can eat whatever you want. You can go see all the sites. Just live it up for the next 10 years. Listen, now there's probably some incredible places that you would go see. There's some things that maybe on your bucket list you've always wanted. You, you saw it on the Travel Channel and you thought, I've got to go see that at some point in my life. Listen, for the next 10 years, you could go see all of it. You could move from country to country, seeing the most beautiful things in the world, and none of it will compare to how beautiful heaven will be. When God creates the, the new heaven and the new earth and you're experiencing, you're walking around, we'll talk about this in a moment, in physical bodies experiencing a physical new earth, uh, what we will experience will be far more beautiful than anything we experience today. That's what scripture says. How about this? Number three, or letter C. In heaven, we learn that we will be recognized. If you've ever wondered, well, will I be able to, to see my old friends? Will I be able to, to know, you know, Mima? Will she know me? Will we be able to see each other? The scripture actually says that you'll recognize, we'll recognize each other. Like the, this church family right now, I, I love gathering together with you on Sundays. How cool would it be when for eternity we'll, we'll all still know each other and hang out together in eternity? We'll see each other. You know what's even crazier? Think about this. How great will it be one day to stand in heaven and have someone come up to you and say, hey, you don't know me, but I recognize you. Well, okay. Yeah, you led the person who led the person who led the person who led me to Christ. Like, oh, wow. 
wow, the kind of the legacy of, of recognition in heaven, of uh, being a, a huge, the bride of Christ gathered together, recognizing each other. It's going to be a beautiful thing. We'll be recognized and be able to recognize others in heaven. I put some scripture there for you on that one. Uh, letter D is this, in heaven you will see God face to face. Oftentimes when you read about people interacting with God in scripture, what you read is that people were able to see, uh, you know, like the glory of God. They were able to, to see the, the presence of God. They knew God was around, but well, they definitely weren't allowed to see God's face because that would certainly kill a person. What we learn about in scripture is that one day God's going to put everything back the way he originally planned it in the garden. You see, when God created the world, he put Adam and Eve in the garden, and he designed it the way he wanted it to be for eternity, that we had physical bodies on a physical earth, and we are living in perfect harmony with, with God and with the nature and animals and creatures around us, that everything was, in, everything was perfect. That's the way he wanted it, and one day that's the way it's going to be again. You see, God created everything in perfect harmony. We saw God face to face. We lived in relationship with God. And then Adam and Eve, they brought sin into the world. And now because of sin, remember God's perfect and in him there is no darkness. And this world is a broken place. So God now resides in, in a supernatural understanding of, of heaven. And he still wanted to be in relationship with us. He still wanted to reside with us. So he said, listen, build this tabernacle. Build this temple. And then I will, I will live in the center of that in this room called the Holy of Holies. That's where I will reside on earth. But even then, people couldn't just walk in there and <clears throat> see God's face. In fact, it was such a dangerous place to be that only one person, one time a year, was allowed into that space. And they certainly weren't going to see God's face in there. They would certainly die. So how amazing is it that God's saying, listen, I, I still wanted to reside. And now in the New Testament church, how does God live among his people? He lives in us. I still haven't seen God's face. I know his Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I know he still longs to be in relationship with me. But how cool one day, after the, those judgments we talked about, uh, I, I understand that there's going to be this physical expression of heaven brought down to earth. This earth is going to be made new and we'll be able to walk on the ground in perfect harmony again with God, seeing him face to face with no opportunity, no more tree, no more choice. At that point, all of us have already made a choice that we want to love God. Those who have made that choice here. We'll see God face to face. Here, here's a, a fifth thing I want you to know is that in heaven, you will have a new and perfect body. I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're looking up here and you're thinking, how does it get better than this, right? <laughs> I imagine there must be, some, no. I'm, now my body, man, I, I woke up this morning and my ankle was hurting. I'm thinking I'm going to be limping around today. I got things, you know, I just cough weird, right? And my back's thrown out for a week. Like our bodies are, <clears throat> our bodies are broken. They're messed up. And I want you to know that, <clears throat> excuse me, in Scripture, it's not this concept of you're going to get this, this like heavenly angel sort of. You know, some of us, we picture what our bodies will be like, and you're picturing like this angel with wings and a halo because that's what some, you know, child, children's story told you about. That, you're, you're not going to, you're not an angel. There are angels that exist. We're not angels. We're humans. And one day, God's going to recreate He's going to tear down this old earth, and he's going to create a new one. And essentially, heaven, uh, the, essentially, the new heaven and the new earth is essentially heaven on earth. And we're going to have physical bodies in a perfect form. I'm hoping that there's not so many change, changes needed to my body that I'm no longer recognizable, right? People are like, you look vaguely familiar in the eyes. Like, uh, who knows? Here's a hard one. I, you know, I put this in the same category of wonderful truths about heaven. This last one is not very wonderful. It's just a truth about heaven. All right, here it is. Most people 
aren't going to heaven. I wish this weren't the case. I wish I could rewrite what God's word says about heaven and be like, hey, could you, can you flip-flop that so that most people get to go to heaven? Uh, but according to scripture, when all is said and done, what has God revealed about the truth about heaven is this. In Matthew 7, it says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. There's only one way. Who's the narrow gate? Jesus. Jesus is the narrow gate. Nobody gets into heaven apart from Jesus Christ. Then it says this, the highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. There's 8 billion people on this planet right now, give or take. According to scripture, and really even according to statistics, very few of those people proclaim the name of Jesus. And even when you're in a, a country that's a, a Christian country, that number is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I pray, man, inside the, the walls of a church like a Arundel Christian church that this statistic isn't true. I pray that when we gather together, we're a body of believers gathered together who have all decided we're going to walk through the narrow gate together. It says in Revelation 21, verse 27, it says, nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry, dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. I want you to think about it this way. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Now, I know someone could argue with me the validity of this statement because technically, guess what? Good people do go to heaven. The problem is that none of us, not a single one of us in this room is good. So if that's the the threshold, that hey, good people go to heaven, fine. But none of us is, is good. The only good person is Jesus. And Jesus has given us the opportunity to be good by switching our rap sheets with his. So ultimately, in the world sense, you might know someone who's a good person. They're kind. They're forgiving. They're lovely. They make cookies for the office every Monday. And they're just like a great person. You're like, man, if anybody should be in heaven, it's, it's Susie, right? It's Joan. It's John. It's Mac. It's whatever. You got you to gotta name of someone that you're like, this is a good person. Unfortunately, the truth is, according to Scripture, good people, there aren't any. And even if there were, in the world sense, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Only people whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who've put their faith in Jesus, go to heaven. So what do we do with this, church? For our our What Now God prayer this morning, as you're sitting there where you are, you have now better, hopefully, understanding of what eternity means, that all of us will exist forever. You understand some of what we're talking about, that Jesus is going to return, and there's going to be a judgment for those who have rejected the Holy Spirit, and there's going to be another judgment, a rewarding type judgment for those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that those who have rejected the Holy Spirit will spend eternity in a real place called hell. And those who have entered into a relationship with Jesus will spend an eternity in heaven with Jesus. What do we do with that information? And I want to challenge you. First, I want to help you remove some fear. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, it says that death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? But thank God... He gives us victory over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not a single one of you has to walk out of here today outside of a relationship with Jesus. Every single one of us can walk through the narrow gate and say, I want to be, I want my name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know that that little dash on your tombstone? One day when you're dead, your physical body's in the dirt. That dash, this life that you're in right now, that's where you determine if you're a citizen of heaven 
or you're a citizen of hell. This dash that you're in right now, it's where you make that decision. It says in Philippians 3.19, it says, non-believers think only about this life here on earth, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. The Bible also tells us in James 4.14 that your life is like a morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. Let me give you another version of this verse. Your dash is really not that long. You're going to be alive for a little while here to determine what happens for eternity for you. You're going to be here for a little while, and then your eternity in a real place called heaven a real place called hell begins. Let's pray together. God, thank you for revealing so much about you and so much about heaven and so much about hell, so much about eternity to us in your in your word. We thank you for the opportunity we have to open it and study it together to recognize truths about what you've revealed to us. Would you allow us to be a church that's excited to walk through the narrow gate together, a church that has placed our faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Would you let, God, any eye that's still blinded, anyone who's still on the the wide path that leads to destruction, would you open up their eyes? Would you remove any blinders from the evil one? Would you allow them to see clearly that they need to be in a relationship with you to experience this gift of a relationship with you, eternal, a relationship with you? Would you open their eyes to that truth today and allow them to to step into the, the courageous decision of telling someone that they are now a follower of Jesus? God, we love you so much. We thank you for all that you do for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.